Thank you very much. Uh, buenos dias. I have to apologize for addressing you in English. I grew up in Southern California, but it's been many years ago and my, my Spanish is not terrible. So uh, try to follow along and, and uh, I'll do my best to, to speak slowly. But um, first off, a terrific thank you to uh, Giancarlo for putting all this together. You put a tremendous amount of work into this in addition to the role he played on the Scientific Steering Committee for the city's IPCC conference that you just heard uh, all about from Brenna. Um, and a big thank you to all the university staff who have been so kind and gracious to us. It's, we're really thrilled to be here uh, and excited to not just talk about some of the research and innovation agenda in the city's IPCC, but the Talanoa Dialogues, uh, which occurred yesterday, which were also really, really important. So um, today, I wanted to speak with you a little bit about the Global Covenant of Mayors. It's a really interesting organization that uh, has come into existence in the last couple of years. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to talk to you about um, Innovate for Cities, which was actually a brand new initiative that was only announced two months ago that was announced in response to what happened at Cities IPCC in terms of a, a need for this cross-mingling, cross-pollination of science, policy, and the private sector. Uh, so that's how I'll use my time to speak with you. Thank you. We'll have to, we'll have to, um, yeah, I need to speak into this for the translation, correct? I can't get up. I, li I like to walk around. I move a lot, so I'll, I'll speak here. Okay. Um, so the Global Covenant of, of Mayors for Climate and Energy, as I mentioned, um, was created about two years ago, uh, and it was actually the merger of two different entities. It was the merger of something called the Compact of Mayors and the European Covenant of Mayors. Um, and what's interesting about this is that over the last maybe 15 years, the proliferation of city networks uh, has exploded. Um, and there's a lot of reason for that. And you're going to hear about it a little later from uh, one of our other colleagues who's going to talk about city networks. But the general gist <coughs> behind this is that a lot, as cities are taking more and more action on different things, not just climate change, there's a variety of things that cities are, have become leaders on, there's more and more need to collaborate and coordinate between them, um, particularly also as it pertains to transformation and technology, which is getting implemented in cities first. So based on this explosion of one, urbanization, two, climate change happening, which impacts cities uh, hardest because that's where the concentration of infrastructure and people are, you've seen this, this growth of these city networks. So there's been a, a need in some sense to help kind of coordinate this because local action takes local knowledge, but at the same time it's very important to coordinate this between countries. So as these networks have started doing that, what happened is that there was a differentiation in terms of approach in terms of knowledge, practice sharing, data standards, et cetera. And that actually be started be becoming confusing to the marketplace. So cities might be involved in a, in a regional network, they might be involved in an international network, and they were being asked to commit um, to different processes using different standards and reporting their data in different ways. So as a result, the cities themselves said, guys, can you please stop doing this, make this a little bit more simple for me. Uh, and two, we were realizing that we were missing the opportunity to really share information because it was becoming too siloed. So you saw these organizations like the Compact of Mayors and the European Covenant of Mayors come together to start coordinating this. So what happened is that uh, after Par the COP21 and the Paris Agreement, there was a, a need to, to create even tighter synergies, and that's how the Global Covenant of Mayors came to be. It, was, it took two global networks that were hubs of other networks and merged them together to become the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. Um, these are some of the things I was already just talking about, but what's, what's important about it and, and why is that it wasn't just to help kind of stimulate and accelerate the transfer of information between cities, but it was also the standardization of data. But that was increasingly important because over the last 10 or 15 years, national governments have also gotten much, much more aware about the importance and the need for cities in terms of implementation. But cities aren't part of the UN process. Uh, and as, as local advocates and city networks ask for more and more access and input into those international collaborations, that the lack of cohesion, the lack of comparability, and the lack of accountability on cities became a, a self-imposed barrier in terms of engaging with the United Nations. So we needed to bring together coherence, and we needed to help create some vertical alignment 
between the different levels of government, <coughs> local, regional, and national. And so new institution, in, international institutions and processes had to be created in order to allow that flow of information from local to national. And now that you're seeing this become ever more important and apparent around the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, and how local governments, subnational governments can be included in those. So uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors is, is comprised of lots and lots of city networks. C40, where I, I used to work for about a decade, ICLEI, UN Habitat, uh, European Commission. Um, you can see all their logos. There's, there's sev several of them. Um, so it is truly global, and they're also very regional partners, as an example, like FCM in Canada and USDN in, in the US. I talked about this a little bit already, so I'm not going to dwell on this. But, but the vision here is that by combining and supporting um, cities and the city networks all over the world, we can one, show solidarity, two, help create momentum and energy to push national governments to be more ambitious and to help convince them that, that we can ratchet up our ambition, uh, and three, bring more resources and tools uh, and decision making to cities by being able to have a platform with which to show what they can do and where they need help. Yeah. So the Global Covenant of Mayors is actually managed by mayors, there is a board. Uh, the board is uh, co-chaired by Michael Bloomberg um, and the, the vice president of the European Commission, uh, Mara Setskevich, and the vice chair is Christiana Figueres, who is the former chair of the UNFCCC. Um, you can see the mayors spread it around from around the world, Global North, Global South, so very good balance. And they actually oversee the development of, of the Global Covenant of Mayors activities. Oops. So this is where it gets really, really exciting because you can start seeing the collective impact now. So instead of being C40, which is a network of some of the 96 of the world's largest cities and the impact they have, which is tremendous, now you can see the impact of cities large and small all over the world. So it's over 9,000 cities across 120 countries. It's representing almost 10.5% of the world's population in those cities. So the breadth and depth of, of the collaborative nature of this is, um, is pretty staggering. And this is where it becomes ever more important. We heard a little bit about this from Diana, who is also a scientific, uh, the co-chair of the Scientific Steering Committee um, for the city's IPCC. We heard a little bit about the impact uh, that cities can have. Um, this is not too dissimilar from that, but this is just looking at the number of cities that uh, are currently part or members of GCOM and what their impact could be. And basically, uh, what some of the analysis has shown is that based on the targets that they've set, that in, within, in 2030, which is you know 12 years from now, uh, cities expected emission reductions for that year would be 3.7 gigatons. That's a pretty sizable number, and that's just based off the commitments now. This graph over here on the right is interesting. What, what that's breaking down is kind of there's different levels of, of power or authority that cities have. In some cases, cities have strong authority over their roads and the parking setbacks, the sidewalk setbacks, and their bus fleets, as an example. In other cities, they don't have very strong power over transportation. It's, it's managed by a regional or federal government. Um, so it's ever, in, ever it's increasingly important for us to be really aware of the types of cities you're dealing with and what they, they have the authority to do versus the, that, what they don't. And we need to get much smarter and much more strategic about asking cities to take action and expecting them to in the areas where they have strong authority. And then we need to look where we can collaborate with them, with, with, with them in areas where they don't. What you're seeing here is a, basically an average of that. This blue area is the amount of GHG emission reductions where cities have on average or across the globe very strong power. This middle, this yellow band here, this critical implementer is where they can be a driving force in helping set the vision, but they need partnership or outside funding. And the red piece here on the mitigation potential uh, reduction is where they can be a strategic partner, but the, the real influence has to come from outside that. So it helps kind of give a perspective and help paint a slightly different picture of cities as really vehicles for change and implementation and terrific collaborators, if we know how to work with them uh, and end in the right ways. So here, this, uh, this is just getting, a, um, I'm a numbers guy. I like, <laughs> I like numbers and I think numbers are important. So, but this is helping kind of paint and provide the narrative in a couple of different scenarios. So what you're seeing here on the, I think it's your top left, um, those are 2020, 2030, and 2050 uh, emissions statistics, whether it's a BAU or reduction potential. Uh, if you pop over to the right-hand side, the aggregate GCOM city emission scenarios, this is going from 2010 to 2050. Again, just start, starting to try to paint a scenario of what's happening if we do take action versus what we don't take action. 
here on the bottom right of the screen, you can see this breaking down for regions um, and the, medition, so the potential emissions reduction based off of BAU from a regional perspective, which gets pretty interesting. Uh, this is a kind of set, this bottom right chart is a, a lot of the problems that have been holding back an international agreement on a uh, climate treaty because trying to get everybody to agree to a process that doesn't make sense. What I mean by that is Global North cities have a much higher greenhouse gas emissions per capita, so they have to have a dramatic reduction in emissions, whereas in the Global South, the per capita emissions generally are very low and they need to ensure that they don't continue to grow. So the types of interventions and the things that you actually need them to commit to are very different, but trying to come up with one process is challenging. This, that, this, this regional variation of the, the difference between a BAU really helps paint that narrative. This is a really, really interesting graph. Um, and this, I think, has a lot to do with the emergence of the power of cities and the awareness of this. But what this is actually charting is transparency, interestingly enough. Because not so long ago, 15, 20 years ago, um, cities didn't do a lot of data reporting in a public sphere. Uh, and oftentimes, that was, that was, you only did that when you absolutely had to. Um, and it was a mechanism by which you could be held accountable or not run for office again because you weren't able to achieve something or you couldn't get the data or you couldn't have uh, a sufficiently simplistic way to provide that information to the general public. So what you can see here is a simple timeline going from left to right um, covering the last 18 years. And you can see some significant milestones here uh, where a new data reporting platform was provided, whether there was an intervention uh, at a COP, uh, where city networks were created, where GCOM was created. And as you can see, the different processes of these data standards getting set up, and you can see cities testing them out, becoming comfortable with them, and seeing the benefits of them. You can see the, the figure on the left here is the number of cities that have committed to these processes. You can see how it's kind of been skyrocketing up over the last, over the last decade. And this is beginning to, to taper off, but we th you're expecting another increase as we engage the private sector in tools to to specifically provide useful information back to cities for implementation purposes. Because right here in the middle of, of, of all of this process, the cities have been reporting that a lot of the data out, and in many cases not getting that value back. It's been helping build an argument, build case, build awareness, build platforms for engagement with the private sector and national government. And now we're starting to see the benefits of, of, of that uh, advocacy uh, and or transparency take effect. Um, this is just a quick slide to say part of what the Global Covenant of Mayors is doing is also creating regional covenants. So there's a number of covenants uh, that are getting set up. The first one was uh, set up in Sub-Saharan Africa. I was, I was in a workshop about six weeks ago where South Asia just launched theirs uh, in New Delhi. And there's also one in Canada um, and one in uh, America. I think there's one in Japan as well. So there's a number of these that are getting rolled out and that's where um, specific implementation and funding can be provided to cities uh, in a specific uh, context. This is a list of the cities committed to the different regions that I was just mentioning. Uh, I won't read through that, but I'll leave it up for a second for you to, for you to see that. So it's both global and regional in nature in terms of the structure. So here's what I wanted to talk and shift gears from the kind of the background uh, and the genesis of the Global Covenant of Mayors, why it's, why it's important, what it's doing, to sp some specific initiatives. And specifically, um, what I've started heading up in the last two months here, which is the Innovate for Cities coming out of the Cities IPCC work I just mentioned. But these three key uh, initiatives that GCOM is focusing on this year is Data for Climate, Innovate for Cities, and Invest for Cities. And it's basically using this global platform uh, of information and data from cities to help advocate for, one, better data tools that I already mentioned. Two, using the, the information and data we have to help provide more innovation and more knowledge generation in a, a co-generated model, which is really a direct takeaway from the city's IPCC call to action. And then we have Invest for Cities. So hopefully also by aligning uh, and having more transparent accountability for cities, we can also reduce the risk associated with investment into cities that they desperately need in terms of infrastructure and development. I'll get in each of these in a little bit more detail. So the data for climate, um, there's been a huge amount of work going on over the last year and a half where we've been working with city networks, cities and the private sector and creating new data standards. So getting everybody bought into a new process that we can use, use and roll out so for both cities engagement and the private sector. So when there's a data architecture, you can, you, you can have more, uh, more freely move that information back and forth between cities, back and forth between organizations, and take the risk out of the private sector in terms of their own R&D investment into tools 
because now you have a, a, a platform and a, and a standard which they can, can build off of. And there's also a global city data portal underway. So cities have been reporting to globally in lots of different mechanisms. Two of them that I've been involved with heavily is the CDP cities and then the ICLE Carbon Registry. So we're working on processes to streamline that and have one single data, data uh, portal for cities around the world. Uh, then there's the Innovate for Cities. Uh, so this is what I've been spending a lot of time on um, uh, over the last couple of months and, and working towards the Global Climate Action Summit that Jan Carlos mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, and this is basically where we are taking all the phen phenomenal input that we've got from academia in terms of the knowledge gaps and the critical areas in terms of science that cities uh, need to focus on as it pertains to climate change. <laughs> But we, we, and we're taking that now, building building in a really strong kind of lens or perspective from city practitioners. So, what are cities and and city staff around the world actually getting challenged with on a daily basis? What are the decisions they're having to make uh, where they don't have all the information or knowledge that they would like to have, and or all the governance or funding? Uh, so we're doing a series of workshops all around the world. Uh, I think we've done five or six already. Actually, Brenna is, is also working on this with me, and we just, we're, I'm happy to report, just got back from Malmo, where it was the Clean Energy Ministerial. Countries from around the world talk about clean energy, and we held a workshop there and, and uh, are st starting to get some really significant traction from uh, governments around the world in understanding the importance of cities and climate change, but also understanding the importance and the relevance of stimulating and the leadership that they can play in stimulating primary research and academic knowledge and a co-generated model of, of uh, implementation um, on helping cities tackle climate change. So the idea here is that by bringing in these different sectors, we help reduce the amount of risk that national governments have in investing in something, because it's not just one entity, one kind of stakeholder's perspective, it's, it's co-mingled, uh, and it's, it's basically prioritized. Um, and with that, we can then sit down and work with national governments on helping them under, understand the increase in investment that they need to make on this topic. Um, this is just a quick summary of the data, the Innovate for Cities, but this last one I want to talk about, a needs assessment. So this is another big exercise that Global Covenant of Mayors has been undertaking for the last year and a half, is actually a world listening tour. It's going around and listening to cities on basically what types of support they need, what types of capacity building, what types of uh, infrastructure, what types of funding. Uh, and this is really uh, a critical piece of work that we can use to strategically provide back to national governments and back to city networks in order to help uh, structure and tweak their engagement with cities moving forward. Um, the Invest for Cities that I mentioned before as, as well, um, you're seeing the, the organizations here, there's a lot of development banks, but this, is, uh, this has been something that's been underway uh, broadly for, for many, many years in GCOM within the last two years, but it's specifically trying to create opportunities and investment vehicles and mechanisms to provide money directly to cities. A lot of times development banks have to go through national governments and there's processes, procedures that make it difficult to get money directly to cities. And on the flip side, we're working with cities to help them understand what they need to do in terms of the capacity building and the rigor with which they need to provide investable type projects in a format and in a process that is consumable and palatable to banks. Yeah. So with that, I think I'll wrap up. We've got some, I think, some presentations from uh, John Carlos, who's going to talk about some local, some local uh, impacts, and I think some time for Q and A after that. But thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Seth.